Brian Rich is our next speaker. So uh, Brian, let's go ahead and have you turn on your audio and let's make sure we can hear you. Hello. Oh, there you are. Good. <laughs> yeah. how, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How am I coming in? Good. Uh, you sound fine. You sound okay. great. Let's go ahead and I know you're a little bit worried about the uh, screen share. Let me, I'm going to go ahead and uh, send the screen share over to you. I'm going to make sure you can hear it. Uh, I'm interested to see, uh, for everybody that's listening in while we do this, um, I'm interested to see Brian's presentation today. Uh, he has a little bit of a different take. He's going to be, uh, from what I understand, more focused on kind of the the, uh, the news of the company and that kind of stuff. It's his first time here. So I want you to give him a warm welcome. Brian, I am able to see your screen. I can see your PowerPoint in its non-expanded mode. There you go. You're perfect. Okay, everything looks good. Mm -hmm. I know we're running a little bit late, so if you had to run over, okay. but, uh, don't feel rushed. We want, we definitely okay. want to more focus on making sure we're not rushed. Uh, if we run a little bit over, that's fine. And uh, I'll get out of your way. Sounds good. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, again, my name is Brian Rich. Um, you know, go ahead and dive right into it. Uh, just for a little context, so I know uh, much of what you've uh, watched today uh, is geared around sort of technical or systematic trading. I've got more of a fundamental approach, um, kind of a top-down macro view, but I think you'll find as we move along uh, from a portfolio management standpoint and a uh, stock selection standpoint, I'm very systematic. Um, so, uh, kind of a unique, uh, investing process and, uh, let's just go ahead and, and get into it. Uh, so, uh, everyone can, can get a feel for what uh, we're going to be talking about. Um, I first want to start with, we're going to step through the, the bigger picture, uh, kind of what the big themes are in markets, what's happening around the world, how policies are impacting markets and the outlook, um, how it all plays into the case for higher stocks um, and higher commodities. Um, we've obviously had a very good run uh, in the stock market, uh, and a lot of people have continued all along the way uh, trying to pick the top, um, questioning the valuation, uh, questioning kind of the fundamentals uh, behind everything. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about that, um, and then uh, – I'll make the case for why I think it's it's all going much higher and uh, why I think commodities are going much higher as well. Um, so uh, we'll do that. We'll talk about how to play it, how I play it, and uh, then we'll take some questions. So let's see. Ah, there we go. Uh, first, who am I? Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm a contributor at Forbes on, on macro investing and activist investing. I write a daily strategy piece as well called Pro Perspectives. And uh, I founded and run uh, the Billionaires Portfolio at billionairesportfolio.com. It's a subscription investment service uh, where I run a 20 stock portfolio of the best stocks owned by the best billionaire investors and hedge funds. Uh, and our subscribers, my subscribers follow my lead and, and uh, the portfolio that I manage. So uh, as you can see on your screen here, here's a little bit more about my background. Um, it's in the hedge fund business, uh, managing money for sophisticated investors. And uh, uh, now I'm sort of an invest tech entrepreneur, as, as you might say, uh, taking kind of hedge fund strategies to uh, kind of a broader uh, audience uh, through the billionaires portfolio. So um, the bigger picture stuff, uh, I talk a lot about the big picture uh, uh, in my weekly notes as I build my portfolio, manage the portfolio, consider uh, sector composition within the portfolio, uh, and it you know, has a big influence on being positioned uh, what I think the right way is for uh, the asset classes and the sectors uh, that have the most upside and no surprise that happens to be where the guys that I, I follow 
uh, tend to find themselves. Uh, the biggest investors, the, the investors that like to take controlling interest in companies um, tend to want to go where there's big value dislocations. Uh, there's an opportunity to create change. And generally, those tend to be in pretty beaten down sectors. Um, so I think if, if we watch the financial media, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to get distracted uh, from an investor's standpoint, um, even from uh, just sort of an average observer uh, and, and try, sort of trying to refine down what the, the real economy looks like. There's a lot of noise, a lot of distractions, a lot of misinformation. I'm hard to get a grip of where things are and where things might be going. So I think, you know, it's really important, especially now, to understand where we've been over this past decade, how the crisis sort of uh, came about, how it unfolded, and where we've gotten to this stage. Because that's, if you don't understand that, you can't possibly understand um, where we might go from here, what the risks are and what the opportunities are, and what the potential influence um, is of, uh, for instance, uh, big and bold fiscal policy that we're, we're seeing right now. Um, just sort of stepping back a bit as an example of this, we look back at, at 2016. I don't know if everyone remembers uh, when oil prices were crashing. Uh, so when oil was dropping you know, from 65 bucks or so to 55 to 45 to 35, uh, if you listen to economists, the media, Wall Street, they were all telling you, Lower oil was going to be good for the consumer. It was going to be good for the economy. Put a few more bucks in the consumer's pocket. Uh, that's going to help consumption. Um, meanwhile, they were all ignoring the fact that shale companies, the U.S. shale industry, was getting crushed. Uh, and if the shale industry imploded, uh, their lender, lenders would also be in trouble. Uh, and given the position of those lenders, the biggest banks in the world, and where they were coming out of the financial crisis, uh, low oil prices at that point were starting to build this Lehman-like scenario again. Uh, and again, most were blindsided by it. Most were thinking, hey, you know, $35 oil is going to be great for the economy, right? And some were even predicting $25, $10 oil. Uh, I believe Goldman Sachs was calling for $10 oil. If we would have seen $10 oil, the guy that was calling for $10 oil probably wouldn't have a job today. Um, so understanding kind of the bigger picture, the condition of banks, and kind of what was behind the crash in oil prices, which was OPEC, uh, rigging a falling oil price to try to put their competition out of business, which is U.S. shale, um, you kind of miss the whole thing. And at one point, as you know, prices continue to bleed lower, finally the central banks woke up and thought, you know, we can't let this go on. Uh, if, uh, if we do, we don't have the ammunition to fight this crisis like we did uh, early into the financial crisis, right? We fired all the bullets. So uh, February of 2016, central banks stepped in, the Bank of Japan stepped in, intervened in the, in the currency markets. Uh, China followed up by pumping uh, liquidity into the banking system there. The ECB cut rates. The Fed came in and pulled effectively three rates hikes off of the table. Uh, that was all a concerted effort to, you know, as we know, the Bank of Japan is outright buying assets anyway to stabilize an asset class. And that was the bottom. When Bank of Japan came in in February, they were the first to step in. Um, and that was the bottom in oil. Oil bounced back. Um, but again, having that perspective, um, obviously stocks uh, took a major hit and really all asset classes in, in the risk environment took a major hit as all, all of that was, was transpiring, uh, but many were very late to the game and, and seeing it happen. Um, so with that, I wanna step back a bit and talk about um, sort of where we've come from in the, in the global economic crisis, because it's very key to what this next year and two look like for stocks and how fiscal stimulus is going to influence things. Um, so just for perspective, if we look back at the, the crisis, 
was global. Over 60 countries simultaneously in recession. Uh, and when you view it with that, with that sort of lens, it changes the way you see everything. A lot of people are very US centric, especially 10 years ago, were extremely US centric and had a very US centric view on the economy. Uh, Wall Street thought early on, I don't know if you remember the messaging coming out of Wall Street in late 09, 2010, they were all telling us it was gonna be a V-shaped recovery. Things were coming back, didn't happen. Then they called the top in the developed world. Now, all of a sudden, their messaging moved on to emerging markets. So, you know, the torch has been passed. It's going to be China now. It's going to be Brazil, the BRICS. Uh, what they fail to understand is that China can't grow at double digits when the U.S., Japan, and Europe are suffering, especially to the, to the extent that they were. So clearly, we saw China slow down quite a bit as well. And I think, you know, bottom line is the crisis was global in nature and the recovery has been global in nature. And uh, that's why it's been slow, slow, so sluggish, uh, because the global economy has been so interconnected. And uh, it was central banks that had to uh, sort of step in and coordinate uh, to stem the tide to avert the disaster. And with that, uh, it was uh, a very s slow progress from the bottom, but not one that one was going to outpace another and uh, one was going to command capital over another, you know, sort of like in a typical uh, typical recession where capital flows might flow from um, one country to another or or one country may be penalized relative to another for weakening their currency, et cetera. Uh, it's sort of a um, global in nature and uh, global recovery. Uh, if we think back to uh, these stages of the crisis and uh, think back to the study uh, by Rogoff and Reinhardt uh, that was mentioned quite a bit by the Fed early on, and they pretty much laid out the script for how this thing was all going to play out in that uh, a, a credit bubble uh, that, that, that built and sort of set this thing all into motion. Typically, when you go back into history, um, the credit bubble here took about 10 years to build. And if you look through eight centuries of financial crises, uh, there are amazing commonalities in the aftermath. Uh, they found that the financial crises tend to lead to sovereign debt crises. Sovereign debt crises tend to be contagious. Uh, well, clearly, we've seen that. Uh, credit bubbles are typically the cause. And deleveraging periods uh, tend to mean ultra slow economic activity as consumers, businesses, you have governments, they're all paying down debt. They're not spending. They're not taking on new debt. It's a debt-driven uh, crisis. And now they're all worried about paying down debt. Uh, and because of this, their research showed early on, even before the whole crisis really was, was, was in full steam, that it took about as long to delever a credit bubble as it took to build. So they already uh, documented the building of the credit bubble at about 10 years. So they told us it should take about 10 years to delever. And that's exactly, you know, sort of where we are in the timeline. You know, maybe give, give or take six, six months or so. Um, and when they went through these historical crises, they found this commonalities of economic growth will trend at lower levels uh, than pre-crisis growth. Housing prices will remain 20 to 50 percent below peak levels. Unemployment will hover around 5 percent higher than pre-crisis levels. So we can check the box on all of these, right? And global financial crises tend to lead to sovereign debt crises and sovereign debt crises uh, tend to go through this building deficits, rising debts, downgrades come, and then you get defaults. Uh, and then when you get defaults, you tend to have this domino effect where one country defaults and then another country defaults and so on. So this all went according to script, but we were able to avert that last stage and it was because of intervention, as you can see on your screen here. We had this globally coordinated monetary policy. Um, the Fed stepped in, 
China stepped in in Europe to help uh, the sovereign debt crisis there, buying Greek debt, buying, buying debt of the, the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, uh, Spain, in addition to Greece, um, the Bank of Japan, obviously the Eurozone, uh, the European Central Bank made this big $1 trillion promise uh, to avert that sovereign debt crisis there from just unraveling. Uh, of course, we had three rounds of QE at the Fed, and then obviously the Bank of Japan came in um, with a big uh, unprecedented uh, level of QE, which they uh, remain kind of intact today. Um, So what's the message here? The message here is that throughout this recovery, it's been central bank led. Central banks have been in control. They've been able to restore confidence, um, give people confidence to buy stocks, give people incentives to buy stocks. As they lowered rates, you can't get a return anywhere. They sort of push you in, out to take some risk to buy stocks. Stocks go up. Uh, they lower rates so that people can refinance housing, so they get the housing activity moving again. Housing prices go up. So on paper, people are feeling wealthier again. They're starting to consume a little bit again. They're creating this little recovery um, by pumping up asset prices uh, through paper wealth. Uh, what they were unable to do, though, uh, was to create – a real sustained recovery and get back to trend growth. We get this low sluggish uh, growth um, that we really couldn't escape from. Uh, and the bet was, as we say here, the big bet, uh, the central banks, you know, kind of had two options. That we take the medicine now and we probably go into a, a long period of depression uh, or they do what they did. They come in and backstop everything and uh, pump liquidity into the system, uh, promise to step in and be a buyer of unlimited amounts of failing uh, sovereign debt in Europe, uh, things like that, to stem the tide of uh, depression, but all we get is slow growth out of it, right? So we're, it's able to create enough confidence to get people living their lives again, but we get slow growth out of it. And it's because of this chart, velocity of money. So this is the rate at which money circulates through the economy. And you can see to the far right of that chart, it hasn't been fast. In fact, it's at historic lows uh, on this chart. Um, bottom line is when we get inflation, we get inflation when, when people are competing for things they're buying today thinking prices might be higher or the widget might be gone tomorrow. Uh, we've had the opposite for the past 10 years, right? So uh, that's why the world uh, up until even the middle of last year, uh, rather the middle of uh, 2016, just prior to the election, we still had these deflationary pressures in this potential spiral into deflation again. And it's because of this chart right here, right? And of course, all along the way, the media was telling us that, you know, the central bankers were just dumping money on all of us, um, throwing money out of helicopters. Uh, but the result was, even if the money were easy to get, which it wasn't, then the people in that environment had no interest in spending it. They wanted to save it. They wanted to pay down debt with it. Uh, and with that, there was no multiplier, multiplier uh, effect in the economy. So. We get this great handoff uh, in 2016. We had the central bank manufactured recovery. It had generated stall speed growth at best, and we were already in mid 2016, kind of spiraling back into this deflationary vortex. We had $12 trillion in global government bonds going negative, and then we have election night, right? We have this fundamental change where we're going to have a pro growth president come in, we're going to have a Congress aligned so that policies can get done, which haven't been able to get done because of political blocking to that point. Uh, so we have this handoff from monetary stimulus-led recovery to a fiscal stimulus-led recovery. 
uh, and that was a big moment, a big deal. So I think, you know, if when we look back 20 years from now on this time period, we'll probably see that that officially ended this 10-year period of deleveraging post-crisis, and that was the turning point for a real sustainable recovery. Now, let's hope it is, and everyone should hope it is, I think, including not just, you know, everyone in our country, but globally, the global economy needs it to work uh, because, uh, you know, if we don't get sustainable uh, recovery coming out of this economic crisis, the world still, even though the data looks good, it's still fragile, you know, because, you know, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that in a moment too, why it's fragile. Here we go. So the missing piece of the puzzle uh, and the reason we had this stall speed growth for, for so long is because the bounce back in demand has not come, right? And where has that been reflected in all of the data? All of the unemployment data has come all the way down from 10 to 4%. Um, inflation, however, is is very tepid, right? Well under what the Fed, and it's been sort of this dislocated um, uh, piece of data for all the central bankers that's been allegedly perplexing to them. Uh, but it's been because demand hasn't come back. They've been able to manufacture confidence to the point where people will hire again, people will spend again, people will build again and invest. Um, <clears throat> But the demand hasn't been strong enough so that employees can walk in and command higher wages, which starts to feed into this, you know, sort of self-reinforcing loop where you get better demand and you get better wages and you get better demand. You know, obviously that's inflationary, uh, which we'll discuss too. But you can see here in this chart of uh, annual wage growth, it's been slow, right? Slow relative to uh, where we left off in the crisis. And that's been... Uh, sort of that canary in the coal mine. So let's talk about why uh, stocks can still go much higher from here. First, you know, if we think about uh, wage growth, let's talk here real quick. If we think about wage growth here, and we think about the opportunity for this to finally start moving and for demand to finally start moving because we're getting fiscal stimulus, because there's a potential for a return of animal spirits coming back, we may just be in the early stages of money moving out of bonds and out of cash and back into stocks, right? And if that's the case, how do stocks look from a value standpoint? Many would say they're already fairly valued. So let's look at evaluation. If we look at uh, the PE on stocks relative to history when rates are low, and rates are still very low, even though they've you know raised rates five times from the bottom, they're historically very, very low. In low rate periods, the PE on stocks tends to run north of 20, all right? So we're looking at, and this is the, on the screen here, we've got $144 of, of uh, S&P 500 earnings, which is what Wall Street thought we would have coming into the end of the year. That was just prior to tax cuts. Um, so, and we were looking at, what, 18 times, uh, um, 18 times earnings at that point. Uh, so historically in low rate periods, if the, if the PE runs north of 20, which it has for about the past three years, and there's no reason to believe it won't go above 20 again this year. Uh, we're looking at something like 29.40. Well, guess what? We've already had a heck of a run to start the year, and we're closing in on that number. Okay, so are stocks fairly valued? Are they cheap? They're not as cheap as they used to from that standpoint. But what that isn't factoring in yet is the corporate tax cut, right? So again, this EPS estimate from Wall Street was before corporate tax cuts, and as hard to believe as it may be. Um, Many still aren't even incorporating that into their estimates. Uh, in fact, the companies are having to come out and say, hey, this is going to make a big difference to us. Uh, we're adjusting up our guidance. 
And it seems that Wall Street's been a little slow to adjust their guidance or their, their estimates. But if we look back in, in, in terms of what the tax cut will mean to earnings, it will go right to the bottom line of companies that are making money. So if you're making money, you're going to make more money now. Um, and the estimates uh, I saw last year going to the cut were anywhere from adding $1.31 for each percentage point of a cut up to $2 for each percentage point of a cut. If we take the low end of that, and we've gone now from 35 to 21 percent um, on the corporate uh, tax rate, that would take this year's earnings to $162, something like that. We apply that to a PE of 20, assuming the forward PE expands like it has for the past three years to 20 or north of 20, and we've got about 32.40 in the S&P. So that's 13 percent higher than it is now. Uh, clearly. More upside, we're already up 7% for the year, so that would uh, kind of imply a 20% year for stocks. I think a lot of people would be happy uh, with that result. But this is what I've been looking at for a long time, and this is what I think is, is probably the most compelling case for stocks. So if we look at the long run uh, return for stocks, runs around 8% annualized going back to the early 1900s, right? So we had a significant uh, we were significantly knocked off of that path, if you will, in 2007, right, with the financial crisis. And I think many would think, <clears throat> just based on certainly the recent returns in stocks, that we've had a heck of a run in stocks. But you can see in the blue line here, we've done about 8% annualized from the bottom. We basically have gotten back to trend growth in stocks from the bottom post-financial crisis, which is great. But what we haven't done is made up for that big gap where we were knocked off path, right? So we have essentially this lost decade of returns in growth. And this also correlates very well with what's happened in the economy. We've had this lost decade of growth in the economy as well, where in typical recessions, you have a big bounce back in growth to sort of put, put us back on path historically. If you look back at all past recessions, we have a, a nice bounce back in growth that runs above trend to put us back on, on the path. We haven't had that. We've been averaging, what, 1.5% growth um, for the past six, seven years. So this argues that we have a tremendous ground to make up to get back on that path for stocks, and we have the same uh, to get back on that path for economic growth. That's why I think, you know, we're probably in the early stages of an economic boom where we can see 4 and 5% growth uh, for several years. Uh, and that to get us back and recover that lost ground for the past decade. Uh, so if we look at purely from uh, the perspective of stocks and financial markets, we're looking at <clears throat> about another 30% higher, uh, I would say justifiably, um, to put us back on this path of, of prosperity for stocks and prosperity for the economy. Okay, um, so that's the case for stocks. Uh, Commodities, I think you're going to see in a moment, have a really compelling case um, because among, we've talked about this kind of dislocated data point and inflation and, and behind that wage growth, commodities have been the dislocated market. And what's the driver of commodities? Generally inflation, right? So if we're about to finally embark on some inflation, as we haven't really seen for the past 10 years, um, commodities are, have some explosive upside. The, uh, so if we think back to that wage chart, the wage growth chart and wage pressures, uh, the tax foundation says that the corporate tax rate cut should double the current annual changes in wages. So we've already seen it in bonus checks since the tax cut was announced. We've seen some wage increases already. If it does indeed finally create this upward pressure on wages, then the inflation picture becomes a big focus for the year. 
and this purple chart inflation expectations, we should see this start moving. And you can see that it correlates very well with commodities. Uh, and frankly, we're already seeing commodities uh, start to really make a move. So that, that makes uh, this chart quite compelling, right? So there, here's the disconnect. You can see the orange line, commodities, purple line, S&P, a huge disconnect in uh, what's happened in broader asset prices, not just stocks, but housing. Um, and then we have commodities going the opposite way the entire time. We have this reflation trade and a reflation trade. Commodities should lead the way. They've been lagging dramatically. They've been lagging. They've been going the other way. Um, so only two times have commodities been this cheap relative to stocks. And the other two times were, were the Great Depression, early 30s, and at the end of the Bretton Woods currency system, early 70s. Both times, commodities went on a tear uh, following that. Uh, and the last time commodities were this cheap relative to stocks, a broad basket of commodities returned 50% annualized for the next four years, and we're up sevenfold over 10 years. So with that in mind, here's a look at the second biggest copper producer in the world, Freeport McMoran. And you can see it's been in this, what, six, seven year downtrend and has recently broken. We own this in uh, our billionaire's portfolio. In uh, Freeport is like a leverage play on copper prices. Uh, so the company says that they'll do about $350 million in additional EBITDA for every 10 cent increase in copper prices. So copper now is around 320. If we see 350 copper, based on current valuations, we should see this stock in the uh, mid 20s. And in that case, uh, from this point, you'd be looking at roughly a 2% move in the stock for every 1% move in the commodity. Um, and that doesn't include any sort of expansion in valuation, which naturally, if commodity prices start running, we'll probably get an expansion in valuation uh, as well, meaning multiples expansion of PE. Now, so I've talked a lot about big picture, economic, top-down stuff. It may be a little boring, um, apologies for that. But where does that get me in my process? So it gets me to a bigger allocation in my portfolio to commodities and commodity stocks. And as I said, um, that kind of comes naturally too as I'm following people, um, big, billionaire investors, multi-billion dollar hedge funds that tend to have concentrated portfolios, take controlling stakes in companies, and they go hunting in places where people have left for dead. So not coincidentally, they tend to have big commodities uh, stakes at the moment, and we have a big commodity stake in our portfolio, about 25% of the portfolio, and commodity stocks, Freeport being one. Um, and in this case, I followed Carl Icahn into Freeport, uh, and this is sort of how we can get into this space and find uh, kind of the cream of the crop, best of breed, uh, where we can do multiples coming out of it uh, and, and lead the pack in the sector coming out of it. Because when copper prices were getting crushed, when commodity prices were getting crush, crushed, we had an influential investor step in, shake up the board shake up management, restructure the debt, make sure that while things were bad and rates were low, they're restructuring debt, paying down debt, refinancing debt, uh, selling off non-core assets, cutting operating costs so we can increase the margins. So now Icon in this case has prepared this company uh, to be like a leverage machine coming out of the recovery in, in copper prices. So now as copper prices, as I said, uh, we're getting 2% move in the stock for every 1% move in copper prices and probably more. That's just based on, you know, sort of uh, what they're going to do in EBITDA. So that kind of goes into how I play it, right? Um, I follow 
activism in the portfolio because I like to have an edge uh, and I get to go into places where there's essentially an arbitrage going on where there's an opportunity to create change in a company that's being mismanaged, um, change in a company that may have poor performing assets that may be dragging down the valuation and there's an, a shareholder that comes in that has a vested interest, a big interest in, in changing things and creating an opportunity for a big return for himself and therefore for us. So um, I'll just go through the bullets here. We, you know, we've talked about the top-down stuff. You know, clearly there's an opportunity in stocks, I think. It's an opportunity in commodities, a really big one. Um, among them, gold, if we're seeing some inflationary pressures finally uh, perking up. Oil obviously has been doing very well, can pop, I think can go much higher, uh, given that OPEC is now or is continuing to cut into what's now becoming an undersupplied market because of all the production that was turned off with low oil prices. Uh, they're still not back online and, and there's a potential real squeeze um, just starting to get underway in oil. Uh, a lot of ways you can take advantage of these kind of what I call ultimate activist plays uh, ultimate activist because we have an administration behind uh, driving the economy higher, which is going to drive valuations higher and the stock market higher. We've got OPEC uh, driving oil higher. They've needed oil high prices higher, and now they've sort of uh, created this this uh, supply squeeze. Um, all this, but I, you know, as I'm positioning in this portfolio, like the guys that I follow, I want to do better. Uh, so these guys like asymmetric returns. They like to go into places and build a portfolio portfolio that looks a little bit more like a private equity portfolio where um, you can come in and, and take a unit of risk and maybe make two or three units of return. Uh, and that's the case in Freeport. I think Freeport's up probably six times from the bottom a year and a half ago. Uh, and still to this to this day, you know, copper's just getting uh, moving. And we're starting to see the business fundamentals really uh, start to drive that stock higher. And then uh, <clears throat> when we think about that and building a portfolio of these stocks, uh, we want to do better than 8%, which is what the stock market gives you uh, over time. And when you compound returns at uh, much higher levels at double digits, you have a potential to, to really uh, create some wealth for yourself, which is what uh, a lot of the guys that we follow in this service have done. Uh, icon being one of them. Um, I'm sure everyone here with some experience has is is well aware of the power of compounding. But you know, just for some perspective, and uh, when I talk about Icon, a guy that's done close to 30% before fees over a lifetime uh, for him, it's you know dating back to the 60s of doing this. 30% annualized turns 25,000 into 5 million in 20 years or 12 billion in 50 years. So when you can put up big numbers, when you can build a portfolio of stocks or whatever the asset class may be that can do uh, some decent double digit returns for you, um, that's where the, you know the real wealth creation and investing comes from. Um, so What's my edge in this, in my, in my process? As I said, I've, I've got a top down, but kind of a systematic process from the bottom up and, and identifying these stocks. Uh, what I do is I follow uh, a group of influential investors and find out what they're buying. I buy what they buy. A um, little more to it than that, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, we've got you know, an example of some of the best uh, that have done it for a long time. And of course, you know, many of these guys uh, would be taking pretty sizable fees. We know them gross of fees. They put up some really amazing turn returns over time. Again, so what makes these guys different than everyone else? Um, they again, tend to hunt in place, places where, where others don't think there's an opportunity. They like big asymmetric risk reward opportunities. Again, I could take one unit of risk, maybe make two or three units of return on it. And I don't have to be right every time to make a lot of money doing that when I spread it across the portfolio. Uh, the old Buffett quote, they're greedy when everyone else is fearful. 
Um, that's why they're in buying beaten down uh, copper producers when no one's even looking at the space. Um, and they have a, an ability to control their own destiny, right? So they can step into a situation where, you know, you and I might think the company's, you know, being mismanaged. There's an opportunity in this company. Um, there's an opportunity in their product, uh, but they're being mismanaged. He can step in, change CEOs, um, shake up the board, force changes, force a divestiture of, of uh, businesses that, you know, aren't adding value to the company. Um, and that's a way, you know, typically we're getting access to millions of dollars of research expertise and, and power and influence for free by following their lead. And how are we doing it? You know, of course, they've got to file a 13D uh, with the SEC, which is, you know, a mandatory disclosure if they're taking a stake of 5% or greater in a stock, especially if they um, have the, uh, the, the intent of creating change or, or engaging management. Uh, they've got to file this and, and typically uh, they'll be pretty articulate with their game plan and uh, in, in what they think is a possibility there uh, because many times they'll write management a letter and tell them, you know, where they're going wrong and, and what the opportunities are. Uh, so it's, it's um, you know, a real inside edge that doesn't really exist um, anywhere else in the market and that they can buy something and step in and, and sort of create their own destiny. Uh, so this is sort of the process. Um, <clears throat> so they take a controlling stake in a stock. They oftentimes can create that catalyst. You know, if you ever uh, are looking at a value stock, undervalued stocks can stay undervalued for a long time. As everyone knows, um, you need a catalyst uh, to get it moving. And oftentimes these guys can become the catalyst by being there and uh, create the catalyst uh, by creating that change. And that, that's the really the key word, change. If what, what reprices a stock is change. If you have the ability to step in and, and create change, you've got a good chance at, at making money and certainly outsized returns on a stock. Um, as we've seen uh, many times uh, when, when these guys come in, uh, and again, just buying a 5% stake in a stock, you know, isn't going to, get you a, a meeting with management necessarily or, or any sort of changes. Influence has a lot to do with it. Respect has a lot to do with it. Uh, the ability to get other institutional investors on board with your idea. So the top guys um, uh, that have a record of achievement in this uh, tend to do better over time. Uh, those that have concentrated portfolios are who I like to follow over time because they have more to lose if they're wrong. Um, I like you know, follow guys that have a lot on the line. Uh, so they're going to work their butts off. They're going to get in their fight. Uh, they're going to fight to uh, uh, to get the result that they want and need uh, to create the return that they need. Uh, so typically, the way this process goes is, you know, gradually sentiment will change in that stock. They'll start to get Wall Street on board. Uh, analysts will start picking up coverage, raising price targets, recommending changes, and then ultimately the momentum players will come in after this change has taken place. Um, and that's typically when we'll see uh, an exit occur. So again, the buying discipline um, kind of covered this, right? So uh, I follow a select group of proven investors that have a record of influencing pe management, uh, influencing boards and creating change uh, by only their high conviction stuff and build a diversified portfolio. You know, number three, obviously, uh, in many walks of investing is the most important, right? You want to give yourself a, a broad spectrum of high potential opportunities. And to sweeten it, uh, I like to find them, and it's not too difficult to, to despite uh, what, you know, kind of uh, the media might say about these big activist campaigns. Oftentimes, you can find them cheaper than what they pay for them. Uh, so keep it simple. Um, Typically, uh, when uh, the billionaire investor exits his stake, I'll sell mine or materially reduces the position, um, I'll sell as well. So let's walk through a, a couple of examples here.
I've already talked a little about uh, about Freeport. We'll sort of step through here. Um, this is Brinks. Uh, so we followed starboard value into Brinks. And uh, you can see where we entered here, uh, where the green dot is. Uh, now, Starboard's one of the best activist investors in the business uh, over the past 13, 14 years. Uh, and they have a record of winning on about eight out of 10 of their activist campaigns, which is pretty amazing statistic. Uh, and one of the easiest uh, activists to follow too, because they tend to be very thorough in their research. They often write very elaborate um, uh, letters to management and to boards, and uh, uh, they tend to want board seats and they tend to fight uh, until they get them. So. Um, the opportunity here at Brinks was uh, underperformance relative to uh, peers. In this case, the key peer was Loomis. And Starboard came in with a plan to uh, cut costs to get margins in line with Loomis. And if they did that, they believed the stock would be a $45 stock. Um, so pretty simple game plan. And that's, if you had to pick uh, one of the easiest Kind of commonalities in activist campaigns that would be one find a company that's not performing uh well relative to their peers uh, there's something you can go in and change if their margins aren't as good typically you can go in um make adjustments and get their margins in line you know maybe they're paying too much on uh overhead paying too much for management compensation is too high whatever the case may be relative to peers obviously um so you can see where they they added to their position where they got board seats, uh, which is very important, kind of seminal moment in this campaign. Uh, and that's where the plan tends to accelerate. They got their operational improvements, they got their margins improvements, and uh, the stock revalued uh, uh, above actually where, where they had uh, targeted. And uh, when they cut their position, we exited uh, there at the red dot. Another example, uh, Babcock and Wilcox. Uh, so this is, uh, we follow Cliff Robbins of Blue Harbor, another activist, uh, known, well, high achievement activist uh, in a stock called Babcock and Wilcox. Robbins runs a concentrated $3 billion portfolio. There's a word concentrated. Um, this was his second biggest position at the time, uh, and it was power generation and energy services company. Robbins thought the power generation side was suppressing the valuation and margins of the energy services side, uh, which serviced government contracts. Thought that was the higher growth business and it was being kind of tamped down by the lower growth business. So he came in, he wanted management to spin off the higher growth business, which he thought the market would then revalue as a standalone company. He thought his investment would double on a spinoff and he was right. Uh, as you can see in the chart, the new lower growth business was separated on uh, July and July of 2015. And the higher growth, higher margin standalone business uh, did nothing but go straight up. Uh, and then uh, we exited at the red dot when Robbins uh, cut his position. Okay, uh, another example, this one's a little bit different. So this is biotech, uh, it's a bit of a different animal. Uh, it's more like private equity investing. You only wanna invest in biotech uh, when you're following people that know the business very, very well. Um, a lot of uh, risk obviously, uh, and few winners. Uh, but in this case, we followed one of the best uh, in the world. He's a biotech specialist, Joe Edelman of, of Perceptive Advisors. They were the top performing large hedge fund in the world in 2015. They put up 50%. And uh, Perceptive uh, has done about 40% annualized before fees since 1999. So they put up some outstanding results and uh, again, primarily focused on biotech. So they've got a record of picking winners and losers, uh, winners from losers, uh, I would say. So if I'm doing anything in biotech, that's one of a uh, very few um, that I would dip a toe in to follow. Uh, and in this case, Edelman employees, numerous analysts uh, with life science backgrounds, some of the world's uh, top schools, Princeton, Harvard, many of whom are PhDs. 
Uh, we followed them into Sarepta. Uh, this was a long, drawn-out drama on Sarepta's ability to get FDA approval on a drug treat treatment uh, on a rare form of mus muscular dystrophy. Uh, you can see in the chart, in this case, we're later to the party. After the scrutiny, it already hit uh, kind of a fever pitch. The media was already all, all over it. Um, and uh, there were a lot of negative, there's a lot of negative news on it. But uh, Edelman, the head of Perceptive, uh, stood confident throughout the whole thing and said uh, that the FDA had no choice but approve the drug. Um, and upon approval, he thought it would be worth a $60 stock. So um, Sarepta's main drug, uh, in this case, slows the progress of this uh, debilitating muscular dystrophy disease in boys. Um, and it aff afflicts more than 20,000 boys in the US and Europe. Uh, and in this case, Edelman, while most investors were running from this, and you can see how choppy this chart is, it's all over the place. Uh, Edelman knows the in and outs of the FDA, and he knows kind of the political uh, uh, pressures of the FDA. Uh, and he knows the very fine points of, of uh, um, the regulations. So in this case, he knew they had uh, no choice but to, uh, to approve it because there was, uh, there was no uh, danger in the drug, although there was questions about the efficacy, but the victims of this disease had no other option. Uh, so that kind of ticked off uh, all of the, um, the requirements to get an approval of the FDA. And uh, indeed, they did go ahead and approve it. And you could see what happened to the stock. And Edelman was pretty much dead on. It went to about 60 bucks, actually went above 60 bucks. And you could see uh, where we exited. Um, one more Office Depot. Uh, this is another starboard value stock. And we followed uh, Jeff Smith again, his team at, at starboard value. And again, another very elaborate uh, thesis on, on Office Depot. Wrote a very thorough plan on unlocking value in the stock, um, which had clearly at the time been underperforming peers at higher cost, at lower margins. Um, plus, the guys at Starboard uh, discovered that the they had this Mexican joint venture owned by ODP uh, that wasn't being consolidated in the financial statements, uh, and therefore therefore wasn't being valued by Wall Street. So. Um, they thought, uh, based on their analysis, that this Mexican unit uh, represented about 76% of the market value of ODP, yet wasn't being valued by Wall Street. So they pushed the company to sell it, uh, and they fought to get that done. But uh, indeed, uh, Office Depot sold that Mexican unit for over a billion dollars. Um, when the market cap for ODP at the time was only 1.2 billion. Uh, so a huge boon, and uh, you can see what happened with the stock. Um, you can see the stages of the campaign as they disclosed their stake, up their stake, wrote a letter to management, and then again, um, that board representation piece, which is key to kind of accelerate that game plan and get that process moving. Okay, uh, so we're kind of wrapping it up now. When we think about following these activist investors, following these influential investors, uh, knowing who to follow is very key, uh, knowing the what, being able to sort of identify the spaces they like to hunt in. Um, in the case, we talked about commodities, uh, which we have a large exposure to in, in the billionaire's portfolio. Uh, know the why, why, they, why they're involved in this stock, um, what the risks are, what their uh, uh, what their risk is, you know, in terms of concentration in their portfolio, uh, timeline for how they might be able to execute on their plan, um, and then of course uh, the experience of building a diverse portfolio of these campaigns, uh, spreading your risk uh, across investors, across sectors, and building a portfolio of stocks that can do multiples of what you pay for them. They have all this asymmetric risk uh, characteristic. Um, 
And then you start to have a portfolio that looks very much like, you know, these multi-billion dollar hedge funds and billionaire investors um, that have been putting up really big numbers uh, their entire careers. My goal is to, at the end of the year, do better than the guys that I follow, which uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But uh, if you can get close, you're on a pretty good track. Um, we've done quite well, uh, even in the face of a very hot stock market. Uh, did about 18% uh, last year, up 50 over two years. And what really matters in these campaigns is where you enter and where you exit. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on between as they're trying to execute on strategy. But generally, uh, the campaigns in our portfolio will run uh, just a little north of a year. And um, you can see when we have exits, we tend to have pretty good success uh, when they finally uh, get their game plans executed. So uh, just to summarize, uh, you know, I, li I like to follow investors that can use the influence to their advantage and therefore I get to use their influence to my advantage um, and the goal is to compound money at high returns by identifying asymmetric risk return stocks um, and making sure we spread that risk and build a diverse portfolio and uh, as Warren Buffett says you only have to have a few good ideas a year to become fabulously rich so that's this idea of uh, uh, spreading your risk and uh, identifying very high opportunity um, investments and in this case as we've said they can they can stay high opportunity for a very long time i.e. Uh, undervalued but in this case we have a built-in catalyst in someone fighting for us every day to uh, execute on a game plan to unlock that value so that's going to do it for me. Um, if anyone has any questions, we can do some Q&A. And Jeff, you'll have to forgive me, but uh, I'm not exactly sure how to see any questions. <laughs> That's OK. I'm actually just, uh, I don't think we'll have a lot of time to take uh, many, just because we're so over. But I'm sending, um, I'm typing in the, I'm trying to make sure I don't spell it wrong. Uh, I did like all of your charts. Maybe we could ask where you uh, where you got all those interesting looking charts and economic figures from. Uh, yeah, so I'm a customer of Zenith Metastock. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> that was just uh, I was looking for a, a plug. There. <laughs> looking for a little plug there. Huh? It, uh, interesting presentation. I'm just looking for maybe like a uh, question we can take really quick. Um, BCC, I had an interesting thought on this one, but uh, BCC had a lot of comments. Um, and, but one of them was, I heard hedge fund managers weren't doing as good as the indices last year. Is that true or fake news? Uh, that's true. Uh, hedge funds have had uh, not a great time over the past uh, really decade, depending on the, the uh, specialization. Macro funds have you know, had spotty success. They've done better in the past year or so. Uh, some activists have done better than others uh, uh, in the past several years. Bill Ackman obviously has had a tough time. Um, Icon too has had uh, a bit of a tough time for the past two years. Uh, but again, that can change pretty quickly. Uh, if the guys that have very long histories, um, you know, it's it becomes pretty intriguing to look at any periods that they might have down. Uh, David Tepper would be a good example too. Uh, so whenever he has a down year, which is very infrequent, he tends to have a very big year following, uh, which means his ideas are just a bit slow to manifest. And in the case of Icon, um, he's had a lot of energy um, as energy was being beaten down. And, uh, you know, I think he's he's going to have a very, very nice year this year. Um, also with that commodities exposure. One more question. Um, uh, this came up a few times, but um, what do you think would be the best uh, three commodities to look at? Uh, as I said, I think oil, is, there's a potential real squeeze going on in oil. Um, iron ore is another really interesting. Uh, it's been kind of a pen down uh, commodity. And uh, a lot of that is because of uh, 
Chinese dumping of, of kind of low quality iron ore. And the fact that they finally have stepped in, you know, first we thought that it was going to be um, U.S. regulation that kind of cleaned up that dumping. But it, in fact, uh, as of last year, China stepped in uh, with this kind of anti-pollution movement and they're starting to clean it up. So that's putting upward pressure. It's kind of unlocking um, the, the ceiling on, uh, on iron ore prices. So, yeah, I like, uh, I like oil. I like iron ore. Um, basically, the base metals are, are, are in a really strong position, especially given that we're just probably in the next month or two going to start hearing a lot about this big infrastructure plan. Um, so the base metals should do really well. Cool. Uh, um, and then um, so the, the, there is some confusion about exactly what it is you do. Uh, so the billionaire's portfolio is a uh, is a newsletter that you sent out, correct? That's right. That's right. So I I do a uh, a weekly newsletter. Uh, my subscribers also have access to uh, a full documented library of all of my communications and my portfolio, uh, where they can look over my shoulder and manage their portfolio according to my twenty stock portfolio. And then of course every week <clears throat> I'll talk about kind of the macro big picture effects on the portfolio, any changes we may have, uh, although the turnover is, you know, as you might expect, is, is pretty light. Like we had uh, five exits last year in our 20 stock portfolio, which means five exits and, you know, five new stocks in the portfolio. So a lot of times on a weekly basis, uh, we'll be talking about any updates on the portfolio. If it's uh, uh, a stock that's kind of Moving along in the progression of, of, you know, maybe our activist that's involved is is um, working on operational efficiencies. We'll start seeing that being reflected in the earnings. We'll dig into the earnings and see where that is. We'll talk about the investor and what progress he's making, which is really, you know, kind of the, the key thing that we're looking for. And that's really what ultimately is going to drive value in the stocks over time. It's what progress um, that they're making with management board to create changes in the stock. So yeah, it's a it's a weekly note, and then we do a quarterly conference call uh, where where I'll step through the portfolio each stock, and we'll do an open Q and A. And how long is the uh, trial? How many how many email or how many uh, is it a month long tree trial? Yeah, is sure. it one so issue? The the services charge quarterly, um, and I've never done a free trial. Uh, but as we discussed, when we were looking for an offer um, to do this. I thought I would I would do it. Uh, so we'll do it for uh, for the first month. Okay. And uh, and if anyone is interested, you can email me. Uh, please tell me your name. Tell me your email address. Um, a, a physical address would be great. A little something about yourself um, to just to sort of participate in the free trial. Uh, just so I kind of know who's there. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, Lewis said, uh, excellent presentation. I'd agree with him. And I think it's uh, time for us to move on. Thank you, Lewis, Thank you. appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff. Great, great presentation, I have to agree. Uh, uh, very different, um, I would say. Uh, it's really nice to kind of have somebody come in and talk big picture stuff. So thank you for your time today. Great, yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I did. I thought it was great. Um, in any case, let's go ahead and kind of just uh, go in. Want to talk a little bit more about the uh, Traders Toolbox? Uh, do uh, let's talk about the speaker um, today. Uh, the Traders Toolbox that we're doing today will feature both of the add-ons that we've talked about with Don Fishback and John Bollinger earlier. You're going to get three months of access to Metastock. Metastock's been rated number one in its price category for like 24 years in a row. We're going to give you training with it. Normally, all that stuff would cost you like nine twenty one uh, for the for the summit special. What we're doing to help you get started is it's just three ninety nine today. If you want to do that with Zenith and with all the real time news and data and that kind of stuff, it's only five ninety. So give us a call 800-882-3040 or visit metastock.com slash sales chat. I'm gonna uh, after uh, the next speaker I go. And uh, I will go into a lot of detail about what Meta stuff will do uh, coming up. Okay. Want to uh, say thank you to our sponsor, Modern Trader. We've said it all day. A great magazine. Uh, they just sent me a bunch of issues uh, in the mail, and I just really, really like their magazine. Um, so 
If you want to get four free issues of Modern Trader, what you'll do is you'll go to that website right there. I'm going to paste the link for you as soon as we get this next person started. And, uh, and by next person, I mean Vlad Carpel. Uh, but it's a great issue. Their offer is really, really simple. Four month uh, subscription to their magazine, totally free of charge. You don't even have to put in a credit card. It's just they, they think you're going to like it. I agree with them. You're going to like it. And um, uh, again, I'll paste the link in there so you don't have to type it up. But uh, I'd recommend you do the four month, no credit card uh, required trial.